I would agree that implementation is key, and I think it's very unsettling for states that treaty bodies, which are referring to the committees often set up to, to deal with treaties um, and to address maybe what they mean or, or take the reports from states on how they're performing under the treaty. It's very disconcerting for a state when the treaty body gives an interpretation of an article that was not necessarily what was conceived of at the time and does it under the veil or saying that it's customary international law. Um, I completely understand that. Um, many of these treaty bodies, though, it has to be reminded, are not binding. And, and states, their determinations are not binding on the state. So the issue of the state's sovereignty is not an issue, and the state can certainly make it clear what its views of that are. I mean, a recent, um, my area that I worked in before was specifically the law of war treaties and some of that, how it related to human rights um, in times of armed conflict. And one of the concerns for the US was the assertion by um, the, a, a treaty body that the uh, International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, one of the articles, um, covered, asserted that it wasn't, oh, how can I say this, that the jurisdiction of the treaty was not if someone was on your territory and within your jurisdiction combined, that's the US interpretation that and is conjunctive, but either on your territory or subject to your jurisdiction. And the US made clear, no, that's not what was made um, done when it was negotiated at the time, and the treaty body, sorry, you're not binding. So not all of these determinations are binding and the states can still exert their sovereignty. Um, it is challenging. I spent a long time, several years at the Commission for Human Rights representing the ICRC there. It was the commission when I was there, so that's a while back. Um, but also even in negotiating, uh, being present at the negotiations for the treaty to prevent enforced disappearances. Um, and it is disconcerting when to finally get states to agree, there might be what's called sometimes constructive ambiguity. Um, in, even in the enforced disappearance treaty within the definition of enforced disappearance itself. Um, but I don't think that because there are challenges to implementation or let's say interpretation, that it means that all international treaties then, because they face this challenge of getting numerous states to agree to each other that they're suddenly worthless and that we won't agree. Obviously, there's sometimes mechanisms that are binding on states to address differences in interpretation um, and or we will see how it's interpreted within, within the state itself. Oh, no. Just a very quick response. Um, I think this is a fair critique of international law, of some international law. The Law of the Sea Convention probably isn't the best example of this because it is lengthy. It's pretty quite well worked out. Um, there are some instances where there's some disagreements, but they're relatively few. One thing that I'll just point to is that that is a critique that can be levied against nearly any law. So imagine any significant domestic law uh, that exists, uh, and you're going to find uh, areas of ambiguity, of disagreement, um, and there's going to be a need for resolution of those ambiguities and disagreements. That's why we have, uh, that's why we have the kind of litigation system that we do. Now, the question I think is that international law is who resolves those disagreements about interpretation? How do those disagreements get resolved? Uh, and of course, that's contingent within each individual treaty as to how those questions are resolved. Most of the disagreements over the law of the sea convention interpretation are resolved in one of two ways. One is through diplomatic interaction, conversation at the highest levels about how to, how to interpret a, an agreement. Um, a second is through arbitration. Those are the key ways. Uh, very, 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 very rarely um, agreements might also go to a tribunal that's been set up, but I think it's heard fewer than 10 cases in its entire existence. So that's an extremely unusual instance. So yes, it's, is there ambiguity? Yes, I've criticized human rights agreements for, uh, for this at length in writing for, for having extensive ambiguity within the text. Um, but I don't think that alone is enough to say uh, international law is sort of different or strange in this way. Domestic law is ambiguous as well. Some of the greatest laws, including our Constitution, uh, leave some areas for interpretation. So that by itself, I think, isn't enough to, to say that we should give up on it. Um, let me turn uh, to Francois and uh, to Europe. Uh, four years ago, um, every newspaper that I'm aware of in France editorialized in favor of ratification of the European Constitution, from the papers on the far left to papers on the far right. There was a referendum on the subject that lost uh, overwhelmingly, then lost again uh, when it was put to a vote in Holland. This time around, uh, you have uh, the Lisbon Treaty, which as you mentioned is about to come into force, which does some of the things that the Constitution uh, uh, was uh, intent on doing. Um, when it was put to a vote a year ago in Ireland, 
uh, it was uh, rejected, so they had this um, let's vote again kind of deal where in part due to exogenous factors like the economic crisis, uh, it was approved. But how does, um, how do you respond to the fact that at the end of the day, the institutions of the European Union suffer from a crippling democracy uh, deficit, that it is testified to the fact that the weakest branch of the European uh, institutions is uh, the parliamentary branch, and that whenever European issues are put to a popular vote, they tend uh, to, uh, they tend to be uh, uh, rejected, which is why parliamentary maneuvers are required to, uh, uh, to, to bring them in, uh, into force. What is, what, what, what is the, how, how does one justify this given what seems to be a basic tension and an abiding tension between what Europeans want and what um, the institutions and the people who staff the institutions and the fonctionnaires claim they want? Okay, uh, I think there are different responses to that question. Uh, first, I would like to mention that uh, it, it is a wrong view, and I mentioned this, and I disagree with Professor uh, Rapkin about that. It's a, it's a wrong view to see uh, Europe as made of nations who gave up on sovereignty. We had to give up on sovereignty, a part of it. We had no choice. If you want to build something, if you want to make family, you have to give up on something. You were a family, your country was a family from 1787, from a constitutional point of view. We were not. Uh, so it's true that we had to give up on, on some issues, but our constitutions remain first. And uh, maybe one of the first responses to, to your question is that the people, the people, who make Europe 600 million, a lot of people. The people remain very attached to their own uh, legal traditions and they remain attached to their constitutions. And uh, the constitution prevail over EU law. It prevails. It means that any country uh, which uh, wants to sign an EU document, binding document, has to modify its constitution before doing this. So from that point of view, sovereignty is preserved. The second response, I think, to your question is that uh, uh, the rejection of uh, the EU constitution comes from the fact that it was presented as a constitution, and it was not. It was not a constitution. It was made of treaties, pre-existing treaties. And uh, what the people rejected, I think, is the idea of being ruled by something which is not really clear in every mind, in every mind because of the uh, reasons you mentioned, because of that huge uh, uh, European bureaucracy. So uh, to end with that, I would say about sovereignty that uh, we had to give up on sovereignty. Why should you? Why should you? You don't have to. We had to because of the reasons I mentioned, because of our history, because what happened in our, uh, uh, on our continent, uh, which was completely destroyed after the war. We had to live together. And you know that one of the main purpose of Europe at the beginning was I mean, to make the Germans peaceful. Yeah, sure. It was made to make, to put Germany into uh, a network, a system, which would, uh, I mean, avoid what happened twice. So uh, I, I think uh, the uh, Euro European constitution was uh, uh, not a, a good thing. It was, to me, it was a mistake. The Lisbon Treaty is uh, probably uh, more appropriate to uh, European thinking. Okay, we're going to go to the audience, and there's a line straight in front of me. I uh, will keep keep your questions to more, no more no more than two grammatical sentences. The last one ending in a question mark, and uh, uh, and the uh, I, I would ask that the panelists uh, respond uh, 
on the brief side so that we can move through uh, the line of people. Sir, right in front.